Hi, my name is Dr. Tanya Trin and I'll be presenting a case on management of the perforated cornea supervised by Professor Alan Slomovic. A 77-year-old female was referred from elsewhere with a history of long-standing irritated left eye for one month. She was a bilateral pseudophage with no other history. She had infectious keratitis with imminent perforation and desmetazeal and was scraped, glued and commenced on fortified antibiotics. There was no identified organism, but she was notably HSV swab positive. She presented six weeks later for definitive penetrating keratoplasty to manage the residual scar once the eye was quiet. The eye is prepped, draped, and a Lieberman speculum is inserted. You can see the opaque outline of the glue patch as we test the globe for how soft it is. We then measure the white to white diameter and also the proposed diameter of the PKP in the horizontal and in the vertical meridians. We notice that there's a fair amount of posterior pressure, so we swap the Lieberman speculum for a Shiot speculum, which distracts the lids away from the globe and decreases posterior pressure. Most of the glue is able to be removed, revealing the decimase membrane underneath. We can see that there is a microperforation after removal of this glue and the eye remains soft. Because of the dampness of the surface, a marking is made as close to centre as possible. We then enter into the eye through the perforation with viscoelastic in an attempt to try and open up the anterior chamber angle with viscoelastic and reform the AC. You'll note with the protrusion of viscoelastic that there's still a lot of posterior pressure. So the decision is made to swap the Shiot speculum for a plain wire speculum. Next, we use the blade of the trephine to mark the location of the proposed PKP cutout. This requires a couple of attempts because the eye is soft and there's a bit of liquid around. Grasping onto the centre tissue, an MVR blade is used to try and create the initial incision just large enough to apply the curved corneal scissors in this gap. We use the curved corneal scissors around as far as the hand will ergonomically allow. This includes flipping the scissors around so that the cutting is able to be progressed in the opposite direction. The old corneal button with the diseased tissue is then removed and the edges tidied up to provide a vertical cut surface. The new PKP tissue is put into place and secured with the first four cardinal sutures using the Pollock forceps. Expeditious closure of the open sky is now of paramount importance given that we had noticed increased posterior pressure earlier in the case. This will prevent catastrophic hemorrhage and extrusion of intraocular contents and vision loss. Careful handling of the needle tip and decisive movements are essential. After the initial cardinal sutures are placed, they are followed by the next four to complete the first set of eight interrupted sutures, and exchange of the viscoelastic in the anterior chamber is performed by irrigating and aspirating out with BSS fluid. The final set of eight of the 16 interrupted sutures is then placed and the sutures rotated into position. After this, there is a final exchange of any remaining viscoelastic with BSS in the anterior chamber and the pressure of the eye is titrated as well as checking all of the wounds for potential leaks. Learning points. One. Control infection and inflammation as much as possible prior to surgery. This minimizes intraoperative bleeding, as seen in this case, and increases chances of graft survival. 2. Use of the Lieberman speculum may cause increased posterior pressure. A shot or wire speculum can be useful here. And 3. When you notice increased posterior pressure, Expeditious closure of the open sky is important to prevent choroidal hemorrhage. Thank you to Professor Alan Slomovic for the supervision. We hope you've learned something from this case, and thanks for listening.